ways that you and I can be more miserable. Here we go. Number 10. If you want to be miserable, think that every Christian must look and act like you. Oh, that kind of hurts because if I had my druthers, <laughs> everybody would. And that will result in misery. God loves variety. Let's remember we must have the essential square in order to be considered small o orthodox. But God, in his kindness, he permits his knucklehead children to find themselves in correctly understood, different looking manifestations of a church and how they actually comport themselves. Number nine, if you want to be miserable, deny the sovereignty of God. <laughs> you deny that God is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he is running everything, there isn't a rogue molecule in the universe, and you are ultimately going to be <laughs> a little bit anxious. Number eight, neglect evangelism. Why would this cause you to be miserable? The answer is because you're not on the same page as God. What is he doing in the world? Everything. I don't care what realm it is. I don't care what the issue is, the dynamic is. God is using all of those things to bring glory to himself through the redemptive work of his son. And if that is what God is about, if you and I never partake in that, then we're going to be miserable. Neglect service in the body of Christ. Yeah, I know this can be hard because aren't those people annoying? I mean, look at all those sinners that you go to church with. How could I possibly find joy and abundant life by serving? Answer, because you're acting like Jesus who did not come to be served, but to serve. And he demonstrated what it looks like by setting aside his rights of divinity so that he could obediently march to a cross to die for us while we were yet sinning. Now that is servanthood. And if we're supposed to look like him, we got to be serving too. And there's no better place to do that in the context of the local church. Want to be miserable? Resist biblical correction. Nobody can tell me what I'm supposed to be. I, who do you think you are? You're just a whippersnap. I've been in the faith longer than you. Congratulations, you're on the road to misery. Why? Well, here's a news blast for me. I don't know everything. Now, that's a little bit shocking, I have to confess to you, because I feel like I do. And I have the propensity to think I'm pretty much doing this correctly. I don't make bad decisions. I, I don't cop attitudes. I don't have motivations that are wrong. The body of Christ should surround you and go, tap, tap, tap. Um, actually, you could use a little bit of help. You want to be miserable? Go to a church that does not preach expositionally. Sure, you can attend a church that doesn't do this sentence by sentence, word by word, book by book. You can go to a church that is orthodox, that doesn't do expository preaching, but you're going to be miserable. Why? Because if you receive nothing but a diet of topical sermons, you are going to be conformed into the image of the preacher and not into the image of Jesus Christ. Because topical sermons tend to be the things we want to talk about. I think these things are, I just read a book and I'm going to tell you everything about it. And if all we hear are the pastor's topical sermons revealing what he's thinking, then my thinking is going to become in alignment with his but probably not into alignment with Jesus, and that'll make you miserable. And number four, if you want to be miserable, be selfish. Number three, you want to be miserable, neglect prayer. Might I dump something on you that potentially will help you to pray better? Brace yourself for this one. 
It was about 20 years ago, I was reading some dead guy, a Puritan who said, don't bother telling me what kind of a Christian you are, how faithful you are. Tell me about your prayer life. Because if you're not a praying person, then you're not a Christian person. Oh, bang, slug, how much should we be praying? What style? What is our pattern? That all falls underneath the category of Christian liberty. But the point is the same. If you're not praying, it is an actual sign that you're not a Christian. Another way to be miserable, neglect the Bible. And finally this, because the two are connected, try to repay Jesus for the cross. Let's see if we can tie these two together by visiting Exodus 40. Exodus, rather fascinating in that God gives a laundry list, a detailed explanation, instructions on how he wants the tabernacle to be built. In other words, God is actually quite concerned about the way that he is worshiped. And then five chapters later, the exact same list. So God said, do this. We ended up doing this, repeating the laundry list. And in Exodus chapter 40, after the children have built the tabernacle, God's glory descends. In other words, the children of Israel could see God's glory. It was veiled and yet, whoa, there it is falling on his prescribed place of worship, the tabernacle. Fast forward to John chapter one, Jesus came and tabernacled among us. Hebrews eight, nine and 10 tells us that the tabernacle and the temple, they're pictures of Jesus. What does John say next? And we beheld his glory. Whoa, wait, what? They looked at the fullness of Christ and they beheld his glory. And the effect, the result was they were changed people. Scoot to 2 Corinthians 3.18. When we stare at Jesus with unveiled face, we are going to be transformed from one level of glory to another. How do we stare at Jesus? The answer is his word. And what do we see there? The purpose for visiting this planet was to save sinners. So if you or I am not regularly staring at Jesus in the word, we're going to miss the message of the cross and you and I are going to just default right back to our work righteous position trying to earn God's favor and it will lead to misery. Uh, read your Bible a lot. Your a lot might be different than mine, but figure out a way to be staring at Jesus with unveiled face in the word and the result will be you will live not a miserable, but an abundant life. Let's take a quick trip to the Philippines. This might sting a wee bit, but we have a huge opportunity to do something amazing. My name is Quito Espiritu, a professor with the Expositors Academy. In the Philippines, the monthly average income is about $500 a month making a John MacArthur Study Bible a luxury item for most believers. In contrast, in the United States, you have commercials featuring a Mercedes-Benz in a driveway with a big red ribbon. By sending a MacArthur Study Bible as a gift to your brothers and sisters in TMAI-led churches, you will be giving them a gift more valuable than any luxury car. What do you say you want to partner with us and the Masters Academy International to send thousands of Bibles to our brothers and sisters in the Philippines? What do you say? How many Bibles could you send? Wretched.org slash Bible. Wretched.org slash Bible. There are two things I've learned about us Christians. We love your end giving and we like a deal. Hey, let's put the two together. Right now we have a matching gift. Every dollar you give, it is doubled. That means your year end giving is a good deal.